and welcome, or welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, the place for lessons from the Bible, from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church, taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Rains. And today we're going to be having some more from our tape archives. This happens to be from uh, February 2nd, 1992. And it's called The Depth of God's Forgiveness, A Path to Build Faith. Wow, the depths of God's forgiveness. How deep is God's forgiveness? I don't think we can even fathom how deep God's forgiveness is. But good message. We're going to try and uh, learn something from this. I haven't heard it yet, so I'm, uh, I'm going to be listening to, it, listening to it the same time you are, so. I'm kind of anxious to see what uh, what it's all about. So let's not waste any time and get right to it and take it away, Pastor Reigns. You can open your Bibles if you want to to <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 54. I'm going to be working with that section in a moment. I've been thinking about one of the greatest causes for Christians not being able to live their lives full of happiness. Why is it that Christians are just overcome with zealousness for the Lord? Sometimes there are those that once knew that zeal or that happiness and they've lost it. What is the cause? Well, I'm going to say what is one of the greatest causes? I believe, and I take this from the scripture, that one of the causes for why we don't have happy Christian lives and live zealous unto the Lord is because of our misunderstanding about the greatness of God's forgiveness. That in his eyes, we're all right. When we're in Jesus. When you don't think you're all right in the eyes of God. This leads to feelings of inferiority. Feelings of unworthiness. Psychologists would call it a poor self-image. It leads to feeling defeated. In fact, to even having defeated attitudes about all of life an unwillingness to take on new challenges. And even in fact, uh, another thing you'll see in such lives is withdrawal from confrontation or conflict anytime it comes up. And the sad thing is that these folk will even withdraw from those kind of conflicts even when God's name and God's glory is at stake. They just won't hold their ground. They're too threatened. There's a shunning of any conversation or any activity where you might be rejected. People hate to be rejected. But those that misunderstand the greatness of God's forgiveness have a special fear of being rejected. They fear that what they say might be rejected if they take a stand. What they do might be rejected because they might be pointed out as being a little strange or different. They don't want to be rejected. Now the problem, I'm going to give it to you in maybe three steps here. First of all, we do see that we're sinners. We do see that we're not perfect. I think there's a universal awareness of that at some point in everybody's life they do see that they don't measure up to a perfect, perfect standard. And secondly, we want to do something, everything we can to overcome that. We want to make ourselves accepted. We want to do whatever we can to make ourselves accepted. But the problem is by others. We're worried about being accepted by people. 
But what we are in the eyes of others isn't really of first importance. It's hard for people to be convinced of that. So, thirdly, here's the problem. That thinking that it's more important to be right in the eyes of people than it is to be right in the eyes of God. We see that we're sinners. We can't be perfect. We just, we want to do everything we can to make ourselves acceptable to people. But we have forgotten that it's more important to be right in the eyes of God than it is to be right in the eyes of people. We've got our, our focus wrong. People will always find something wrong with you. You will always have reason for those fears of rejection. You'll always have grounds for withdrawing. Because there are things wrong with you in yourself. And there's, in fact, so much wrong with you, you could never make it perfect in yourself. We just don't understand the greatness of God's love. We don't understand how much we're loved. Here's a question. How do you measure the love of God? I mean, in practical terms, getting it down to this earth in a way that, that's, that's able to be seen, felt, measured. How do you measure the love of God in this life? Now, I think there's an answer for us from the scriptures, and it's all around us. By seeing what he has done, the record of what he has done, or will do, by the way, because there's promises of God's heart's desire to do things that he hasn't done as yet for us, but by seeing God at work in what he's done and what he's going to do to show his forgiveness. What has he done that shows us his forgiveness? What will he do that shows us his forgiveness? If you could believe that God loves you and truly accepts you into that close inner circle of fellowship right there with him, that he wants you close to him, if you could believe that, that he wants you close to him in everything and forever, for all of eternity. He wants you to share a love relationship with him that he would never shut you out of, that he would never choose somebody else for and set you aside, that you are assured of being in that most intimate place of being loved. If you could believe that, or if you had everything from the Lord that you would ever need, to believe that, what would it do to you? How would it change you? Couldn't you love him more? Couldn't you talk to him more? That's called prayer. Couldn't you talk about him more? We call that witnessing. Couldn't you teach about him more? Wherever you had an opportunity? Couldn't you encourage others in him? Couldn't you give more of your time, more of your energy, more of your skills, more of your talents, more of your resources? Couldn't you give more of yourself if you knew you were loved that way? And that nothing could take it away? Couldn't you be more bold in bringing others to him then? Couldn't you be more involved in building up God's people? Discipling? helping them grow. Couldn't you get, let's say, a, a whole new outlook look on what it means to be a Christian and what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian? To understand this, I want to take a look at how God sees Israel as a nation. 
Because uh, though Israel has sinned, they've rejected God. They've rejected the Savior for over 3,000 years. In fact, uh, as I look back over this, if I were to go all the way back to Abraham, uh, we'd have to say, really, if you wanted to round it off, it, it isn't quite that much, but it would be almost 4,000 years. Terrible record of a people specially chosen for a fellowship with him, for a love relationship with him. And they just haven't responded at all. Oh, there have been bright moments, but as a people, as a nation, they've been rejecting him and rejecting him and rejecting him through the centuries, going on in their blindness. I want you to go to Isaiah 54 for this few words from the Scripture. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you have not travailed with child. For more the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. What you have there is a call to Israel to break into a joyful, glad song. You see, as Israel has rejected the Lord all through the years, she's been uh, as a desolate woman, a desolate woman is one shut out, you know, one that's abandoned. Um, John says it well in John chapter 1. He came to his own, and his own received him not. One, eleven. And I'll read it in the New King James, so I have it just. Some of you are reading it there. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. They did not receive him. It means they rejected him. Do you remember the terrible indictment over in the book of Acts in chapter 7, when Stephen is crying out to Israel because of their rejection of the Savior. It cost him his life. He was the first Christian martyr. But um, he says, here it is in Acts 7, 52. Here's what Stephen says. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. That's the, one of the Lord Jesus' names. Of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Which of the prophets, he says, didn't your fathers persecute? They killed them. The messengers of God, they killed him. They rejected his message. They rejected his messengers. And finally, he sent his son, as Jesus told in the parable about the man who owned a vineyard. Finally, he sent his son, and they killed him. Talk about rejection. You fear rejection? There is no greater rejection than this rejection that the Lord Jesus and the God of creation, our Father, has gotten from mankind. He has been absolutely rejected. And the nation that he chose for himself, this nation that he chose in Abraham, when he looked out across the nations, and he chose Abraham for himself, and through him, Isaac, and through Isaac, Jacob, and through Jacob, the 12 fathers of the tribes of Israel, and all that nation, he chose them for himself for a very special, special fellowship. He gave them prophets. He gave them the written scriptures, and he gave them the living Lord Jesus, and they rejected, they rejected, they rejected, they rejected. Well, now you're reading a little bit in the book of Isaiah 40, 54 that's saying it's time to rejoice. Time to rejoice because you... you uh, might remember now that you are barren. You've been a desolate woman. You've been utterly rejected. But, he's saying, 
more the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman. A woman that has had her husband has been able to bear children. You'd think, oh my, how blessed she is. But this one, and this woman that he's talking to is a representative a figure of Israel. This woman that has been desolate and barren, this is Israel. And Israel hasn't born any children. She's been desolate for century after century, millennia after millennia. She's been, she's been childless and barren and desolate. Israel has been scattered among the nations, worshiping God in darkness for over 2,000 years. It's been almost 2,000 years since Christ. They've been rejecting God over 3,000 years. They're desolate. But the day is going to come when he says to her, Israel, it's time to rejoice. You couldn't be more sinful. You couldn't be more dirty. You couldn't be have more cause for God to deal harshly with you than to have rejected him over and over and over and to slay the very Savior that came to you. You couldn't have better grounds for a poor image of yourself. You couldn't have better grounds for discouragement. And therefore, for turning away from God and, and turning to the world, maybe make some sense out of life. But God says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. There is a day coming when I'm going to have you rejoice. You are going to have more children than a woman who has been married. How can a desolate woman have more children? Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your habitation. Why would a desolate woman need a larger tent, a larger place to live? Because she's going to have more children. She's going to have a wonderful, wonderful home filled with children. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. You're going to need strong stakes to hold up this big tent, he's saying. Stretch it out. Don't spare, you know, don't limit yourself. Go ahead, make the tent larger. Go to the right and to the left. God, you mean you're going to give me children like that? Now, why would God change toward the one that he has shut out? Why would he change? And, and, and after centuries of desolate wandering in darkness, why would he come to her and say, now it's time for joy? For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your des descendants will inhabit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. There is a period of time called tribulation coming in the earth for seven years, where every city in this earth is going to be cast down. It's going to be in rubble. The nations will come together against God and after all of the terrible things that will happen on the earth and the loss of life through the deceptions of Satan, through the hatred of God, the Lord Jesus is going to return. And he has promised to this little nation, Israel, that he is going to let them, their descendants, inhabit the nations and all their desolate cities. He is going to set up a kingdom and all those broken down cities will be rebuilt. And all the nations of the earth will worship the Savior and honor that nation that he shall worship, that he shall reign over the earth through Israel. How could this one that's been set aside for hundreds and hundreds of years ever hope to be in such a place of glory, such a place of honor, that through her, that nation, the Lord is going to reign over the earth. Through her, all the nations, all the Gentile nations will, will honor him. How could there ever be such a hope? There's only one way for that hope to ever come to pass, and that is for her sin to be utterly and absolutely forgiven. She would have to be washed clean 
all those thousands of years of filth and wandering and rejection and murder and hatred of God, all of that would have to be utterly and absolutely cleansed away. There's no other way. Is God able to love a people that much, that long, that fully? Is he able to provide a cleansing that is that complete? Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, nor be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. It's going to be behind you. For your maker is your husband. Now look at all the names of God in verse 5. The Lord of hosts is his name. Host there means of the armies. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. That's the same title, by the way, that Stephen gave him. The one that died on the cross, the just one. He is called the God of the whole earth. That is her husband. That's the one that she's going to be close with. That's the one that she's going to know intimate fellowship with. That's the one that's going to say, you're all right. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment, here's, here's God's concept of time now in verse 7. For a mere moment, I have forsaken you. What? A mere moment? God, it has been thousands of years. God says, listen, that's a mere moment with me. Thousands of years shut out. A fellowship with God. It's a mere moment. And when that moment is ended, it will never be remembered, he says. I told you about the little boy on uh, radio one day broadcasting from Winona Lake. They had him on a stair up behind the podium. Uh, stare a chair up behind the podium and he was leaning into the microphone he was giving a word of testimony it was on the hillside service 615 service he used to have but they broadcast it over the radio and they had testimonies and singing on that little service and he was standing up there and he says i am seven years old and i thank the lord i have received jesus as my savior and he has taken all my sin away but i I'm very ashamed to have to tell you that I lived four long years in sin. They were long years. When you're seven and you live four of them in sin, that's long. Israel has lived over three thousand years in sin. Almost four thousand years in sin. But when she is redeemed, when she turns to Christ, she will not remember the sin days. She will know she is loved. No saint that has entered into the grace of God and knows the love of God and the true forgiveness of God has any business casting their eyes back with condemnation on themselves or others for the sin that was in the past that has been forgiven and washed under the blood of Christ. We condemn ourselves when God himself doesn't condemn us. That doesn't give us license to go on sinning. It calls us to righteousness. And it certainly tells us we have no grounds, 
not to live freely before our God and freely among his people and to give ourselves zealously and unashamedly to speak for him and to teach and to be a part of the body as we ought to be and to give ourselves to that energetically, fully, without shame. The world may reject us, yes, but we're clean in the eyes of God. We're accepted in him. We're loved in him. And what we are in his eyes is far, far, far more important than what we are in the world's eyes. If he can forgive Israel, he says in verse 8, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you. Now what are you going to focus on? The little bit of wrath in his displeasure in your life because of your sin? Or his assurance of his kindness that will never be broken? Of his everlasting love for you? You're okay in his eyes if you have received Jesus. And if you sin, and you will, he will deal with you as a child. He will never reject you. He will spank you. He will correct you because he loves you, but he will never reject you. You have absolutely no grounds for holding back in living out your life 100% for your Lord. If this is true for Israel, can't you see it's true for you? Father, thank you for such grace that you love us so and the forgiveness that we have in Christ that it cleanses us. That you put our sin as far from us as the east is from the west and remember it against us no more. That you bury it in the depths of the sea. That you love us with an everlasting love and that your kindness will never be taken from us. that no weapon formed against us will ever prosper. Lord, might we just give our hearts in abandon to love you and serve you and change the priorities in our life so we could use more of our time and our energies to reach this world, to disciple people, and to build up the body of those that you have redeemed with your own blood. Thank you for such love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, there we go. Thank you, Pastor Rains. Wasn't that a great message? I really liked it. If you liked it, come back again. We'll have more next week. We have plenty more in the tape archives. So just come on back. Bring your friends, too. So that'd be good if you were to, if you were to uh, subscribe, go to your podcast uh, app of choice and subscribe. I suggest you use the Podbean app. That's usually my favorite one. That one's got the nice uh, um, transcripts with it or the captions. And speaking of captions, I'm also using those captions to make into a downloadable document. I'm still working on that. But I'm going to be having those pretty soon. So maybe if you want to like print them out and you know, read over them. And I mean, just the few that I've done so far seem like really good. They seem like they would be in, in a book. I think they could be used in a book. So you could do that. So you could come on back and we'll listen together. Some more messages, because <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to be putting on next week. Uh, I think this is the uh, is it the last one for October. I'm not sure. So we're going into November. We'll be having more. I've been thinking about more and more what to put up for Christmas. So I'm not sure. I might come up with something. But keep coming back. And the way to know that new episodes come out is to subscribe. So you could do that. All righty then. So with that being said, I'll see you next week. And okay, you know what I always say? 
have a great day and a great week or a great whatever. Just have a great one. <laughs> okay, I'll see you next time. <laughs>